Hello, and welcome to a digital mathematics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through module 8 in Math 1040, describing data. And the way that I'm going to structure this is I'm going to split this up into at least two videos. In this first video, I'm going to be going through the first section of describing data, which I believe should be the graphical representations. So now that we've collected the data, which we went through in module seven, how we talked about how to sample data and how to analyze very good or very bad samples. Now that we have the data, we're gonna be talking about how to represent that. Because it really is in poor form for statisticians uh, to really give data to readers and observers like this, to just list out all the data even for a smallish sample like this, even for this sample that only has know, a couple dozen or so uh, different responses here, we want a better way of putting this information down. And we're going to talk about a few ways of doing that. First with our qualitative data. Remember that qualitative data from module seven refers to data that are qualities. For example, these values that I have here, B, G, Y, B, L, and A, and R, these are all what I'm going to have our eye color. Eye color being a very good example of qualitative data. For this instance, I'll have that B is blue, or actually B is brown. I'll have that G is green. I'll have that Y is yellow. I'll have that BL is blue, A is amber, and R is red. So those are the eye colors I'm going to be working with here. And again, this, the, the way that this data is pre presented doesn't really mean anything to the reader, because this is just a list of letters. However, if we want to summarize that down, what we could easily do is create what we call a frequency chart. A frequency chart is basically the first step to getting to graphical representations of data. And with a frequency chart, all we're going to do is have the frequency count for all of my values. Frequency meaning how frequent or how often a value occurred. So, for example, here, the way I present this data as a frequency chart, I would make a two-way table like this, or just a, a two-column uh, graph here. And I'd have the color, so eye color, and it's a corresponding frequency. So F-R-E-Q. My colors are brown, green, yellow, blue, amber, and red. And if I want to count the frequency, I, I just look at how many browns there are. There's one, two, three, four browns. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven green. And now I'm summarizing this data in a much more readable manner. It's a lot easier to clearly see how many there are comparing to other different colors. If I continue with this yellow, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Blue, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. A, there's one, two, three, four, five. And there are two red. So this would be a nice, good frequency chart. One of the first things that you can do is make a frequency chart like this. It's a really good way of representing the data. Now, when I move on from that, this is just showing the data with numbers. And, and again, not always the best, depending on what audience you're trying to present to. If you're trying to present to statisticians or other mathematicians, we love numbers. We like looking at these. But for those that are not as mathematically inclined or don't really work with math too much uh, every single day, it may be better to represent it as a graphical format instead. And our first graph we can create with this is a simple bar graph, which hopefully you have seen before today. A bar graph is one of the classic ways of representing qualitative data. A bar graph will be a graph that has just the x and a y axis, so my x and y axis, the x axis representing my qualities. So my x axis down here, this is going to be my colors. So I have B, I have G, Y, BL, a and R. And my Y axis, this is going to represent my frequency. 
or how often each of these occurred. If I look at my numbers, the highest they go up to is, is 8, and I see a lot with 2, so I'll just go up by every 2. So that tick will be 2, 4, trying to keep these spaces consistent, 6, 8, maybe that's a little too far, but we're just trying to get a rough estimate here. Let me erase this blue so I can have a little bit more room here. Okay. All right, so that's blue. So this is what I would want for my bar graph. So frequency and colors. And then for each of my colors here, I'm going to have a bar coming out of each of them. So B goes up to 4, so a bar that goes up to 4, like so. G goes up to 7, so somewhere between 6 and 8. Y goes up to 8 like so. Blue goes up to 6. Amber goes up to 5. About there. And red goes up to 2. So roughly there. This would be an example of a bar graph. And to top it off, we'd give it a nice title, something just like I colors blah 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 some title that gives an idea that way you can have a graph that stands on its own without having like a paragraph that needs to be with it to explain what's going on this would be an example of a bar graph a nice really easy way to visually show things like I could see here okay well yellow is double what it is for brown so that's that. Uh, red is a lot smaller than all the other ones. Amber and blue are pretty close together. I can make a lot of visual comparisons just looking at the heights of the bars because that's what we compare in a bar graph, how tall each of the bars are. So that's one of our first ways of, of representing data. Now these work pretty well for a lot of circumstances and these are usually preferred. Uh, there's just a couple things you always need to be worried about them that like there's good labels here. You always want the labels on everything. You also want to make sure that my bar graph always starts at zero. The point being the bars, you're supposed to be comparing how tall they are. So if I were to start this instead at one or something, then that would make one of these bars look a lot uh, taller than it is compared to other ones. Uh, just think about if I had two lines, like this line and this line. Yeah, these lines look pretty close to each other. There's there's a little bit of difference, and this one's definitely longer. However, if I didn't look at that entire line of it, if I instead just looked at that piece of it, well, now the top line looks like it's double the other one. But that's misleading because I'm missing a lot of the information. So, for bar graphs, you should always start at zero. That's one type of graph we could make. Another graph that we often use for qualitative data is a pie chart or a pie graph. These have also been around for a really long time, around the 1800s, I think. Uh, Florence Nightingale really helped popularize uh, pie charts. Um, and pie charts take the frequencies that you have and turn them into what we call relative frequencies or turn them into percentages. So what I can do to start to create my pie graph, I can go back to my frequency chart and instead work with relative frequencies. Relative frequencies or percentages simply take the frequency value and put it in terms of how many total do I have here. So if I quickly add these up, if I do 4 plus 7 plus 8 plus 6 plus 5 plus 2 in my calculator here, I have a total, it's a total, of 32 different responses here for my eye colors. So for my relative frequencies or percentages, I would simply put all of these out of 32. So I can have a comparison to say, all right, out of how many do I actually have? Relative frequencies and percentages tend to be a lot more useful anyway, because if I were to tell you that I analyzed individuals and found that eight of them had yellow eyes, your question would then be, okay, out of how many? 8 out of 10? That's a lot. 8 out of 800? That's not so many. So it is really important to talk about what uh, my values are relative to, so what the total is. Now, to create my pie chart, what I would do, create a 
decent-ish looking circle. That's not too bad. It's a little bit flat over here. And what I want to do is represent all these percentages. So, for example, brown, I have 4 out of 32. That's 0.125, or half of a quarter. So if that's a quarter, this would be about 12.5%. So this would be brown. Green is 7 out of 32, which is a little bit less than a quarter. So if that'd be a quarter, maybe something like this. Or green. Yellow is 8 out of 32. That is a perfect quarter. So like so. That'd probably be yellow. Blue is a little bit less than a quarter, so something like this. Amber is a little bit less than that as well, so somewhere around there. Amber, and this would be red. And all of these are based on percentages, so based on my percentage values. Now, obviously, my pie chart isn't perfect because I didn't really use graphical software to create it. And one big mistake I see is that red looks too big compared to brown, so maybe amber should be... A little bit bigger something like that or so that way it does look like red is half of what brown is something like that so if you use graphical software it makes it better but this is also not too bad because then you can still compare sizes of things the only problem with pie charts is that now you're working with more dimensions than you really should have to um, with pie charts, the way that a person reads it is by looking at this shape here uh, for yellow and this shape for green, and they're trying to visually see how well they compare to each other. And you even saw when I was working with it, I had a little bit of trouble trying to think about how big some of these percentages should be when I calculated like 7 divided by 32. Um, and that's kind of hard for a person to look at visually and say, all right, well, Yellow and green. Yellow looks a little bit bigger, but I'm not really sure by how much, and I'm not sure how like yellow and red compare to each other because they're a little bit further away and they're uh, much more different sizes. So it's a lot harder to compare the actual size of them, um, and that's because you're introducing more dimensions than you should have to. Uh, with pie charts, you're analyzing area, you're analyzing the size of the shape, whereas with a bar graph over here, you're just comparing length, so how tall the bars are. That's a, just a one-dimensional shape. So, pie charts are fine, but they make things sometimes a little more complicated than they need to, but they look very visually appealing, particularly when you color them and make them look prettier. Uh, just don't ever make them three-dimensional, because then you're introducing a third dimension and making it even harder to read. Okay, so those are our three primary types of uh, representing qualitative data. Frequency charts, bar graphs, and pie charts. I will also note that there is something special called a Pareto chart. So I'll say like op uh, an extra one, I'll move it more down here. Pareto chart. I'll say this one's optional. A Pareto chart is just a bar graph that has the bars in descending order. So looking at my bar graph where yellow is the highest bar, it would move that to the front here. And then it would move the next highest to green second, and the next highest, which is blue, third, and then after that, amber and uh, brown, and then red. So it would put them in descending order. Just That's just a special type of bar graph, and you sometimes see it more in business cases, but um, it's, it doesn't really change anything. Most of what we'll deal with here are bar graphs. All right, so that's an example of dealing with frequency charts, bar graphs, and pie charts. Now let's go through a couple examples provided by the OER textbook here. Create a bar graph and pie chart to illustrate the grades on a history exam below. A is 12 students, B is 19, C is 14, D is 4, and F is 5. Uh, I will say, for all try it now questions that I do on this video and for others, always pause the video, see if you can try the problem yourself on a separate sheet of paper, then unpause and see how you did. So, I'm going to move on as if you unpaused, though. Alright, so look at my values, 12, 19, 14, 4, and 5. I need to make a bar graph and a pie chart, um, so let's find what these values are. Um, I'll just summarize the data over here real quick, so it's a little bit easier for me to work with. Um, a, B, C, D, F... And we have 12, 19, 14, 4, and 5. 
Now, at the moment, I don't necessarily need to know the total for the first graph or the pie chart for, for the bar graph, but I do need it for the pie chart. So I'm going to total all these together, and what I have are a total of 54 students. I'm going to need to know that so I can get my relative frequencies or percentages. And I'll note those right now. So grade, frequency, let's do my relative frequency. To get my relative frequency or percentages, what I'm going to do is take each of these values and divide by the total of 54. That puts it relative to the total. And I'll put down the percentage itself. So 12 divided by 54 gives you about 22%. I'm going to be rounding all of these. 19 out of 54 gives you about 35%. 14 out of 54 gives you about 26%. 4 out of 54 gives you about 7%. And then 5 out of 54 gives you a little bit less than 10%, so yeah, 9%. All right, so those would be my relative frequencies. Now, what you do also want to be careful of is adding these percentages together and see if they're roughly 100. If they're not perfectly 100, that's because of just some round-off error. Um, but if it's something like 95 or 105, you need to probably check this. If I do add these up together, though, they're not perfectly 100. They uh, are about 99%, which is close enough to 100. It's just because there was a lot of values that rounded in different ways. So that's that's good enough. Now, for my actual graphs. This is just so I can have the data organized and then I have to keep looking up here. Now for my graphs. For my bar graph, I'm going to say, all right, history exam as my title. And on the bottom, these values are going to be the grades on that exam. So A first, B, C, D, and F. Looking at my frequencies, because uh, it probably wants us to draw the frequencies, uh, they go up to about 19 and start uh, pretty low from there. So maybe if I just go up by 4s, up to 20, that'd be good. So 4, 8. You basically just want enough information so it's easy for both the reader and you to work with this graph. So 4, 8, 12, 16. And 20. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. All right, good enough. All right, the more information, the better. If you wanted to go up by twos, that, that's fine. It's just my program doesn't work too well for that. So uh, A goes up to 12, so it goes up right there. So I'll make a bar that goes right about to there, right about to 12. Uh, B goes just south of 19, or no, just south of 20, so right about there. Make a bar that goes up to about that high. C goes to 14, which is between 12 and 16, so around there. D goes up to 4. As you're making this, I want to note that you should not have the bars connect to each other. If you do have the bars touch each other, that actually is a different type of graph, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, that will be in the qu quantitative data. And F goes up to 5. So that would be an example. I should also have a label over here for my y-axis. These are my frequencies. Or you could say counts, something similar that says frequency or number of. So grades, number, grades, count, grades, students, something like that. So this would be a good example of a bar graph. I can compare them back and forth, and yeah, so pretty nice. Now if I make a pie chart, Again, excuse my percentages here. I'm going to try these as best I can. 22%. Uh, best way I'd, I try to do that, 25% would be a quarter of the graph. So 22 is a little bit less than that. So this would be A. Uh, if I do 22 plus 35, that gets me over half and a little bit more. So maybe around there, that'd be B. 26, that also gets me over three quarters, so around there, the BC. And 7 and 9% take up the rest, and they're about evenly split, but a little bit more for uh, F. So F, 
and D. All right, and again, I'll give a history exam title for this. And if you instead had different colors, you could always color these like blue and orange and then have a legend over here saying what colors those are and their percentages. If you want to be even better, you can say right now this is 22%, this is 35%, and then put all the percentages here for each piece. It's another good way of uh, covering your base, bases, particularly if you're not as good as drawing percent, uh, pie charts like I am. Otherwise, that's a pretty good representation of a pie graph. All right. So from there, let's look at another example. We're going to do one more example of qualitative data before we get into quantitative data. A poll was taken asking people if they agreed with the positions of the four candidates for county office. Does the pie chart present a good representation of this data? Explain. We have Noyan, McGee, Brown and Jones. Okay, um, if we look at the graph, everything seems okay because we're looking at these percentages and they seem to compare well, like this 35 seems smaller than the 52. However, if we look deeper at the percentages themselves, this looks wrong. 42 plus 64, that's already over 100%. Plus 52 plus 35, I think this is almost 200%. This graph should represent 100% of the data, and each slide should represent a percentage of 100, or percentage of that whole. Um, where it looks like these are percentages comparing, like, uh, what percentage of people agree with Noya, what percentage agree with McKee, what percentage agree with Brown and Jones, etc. So, what does this pie chart present a good representation of this data? I'd say no, just because it looks like you're trying to compare different types of information, uh, like. Uh, how many people agree with Jones, how many people agree with Brown and McKee and Noyan. And it looks like that there can be overlap. Like some people that agree with Jones can probably also agree with Brown, can also probably agree with McKee. So this doesn't really look good when pie charts are really supposed to be representing data that's split. Like in our last case with A, B, C, and D, we don't, and F, we don't have people that are both in A and also in B and also in C. We don't have groups like that. Whereas this data looks like you can have that. Um, so I'd say that this is not really a good representation of this data. You'd probably use a different graph to show this. Okay. So bar graphs and pie charts, that's how you can represent qualitative data relatively accurately in the most classic ways of doing so. Uh, but we also have other things to work with for quantitative data. Remember that quantitative data is data that represents quantities or numerical measures. So like if I had the numbers two, 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 three, three, and this is just how many children are in a household. And I just sample a bunch of households in Utah and I see how many children are in those households, something like that, something like this. Um, then this would be a representation of the data, but we still want to show this in another way. And we can still use frequency graphs, but we have to, we, we're going to be a little bit better about this. What we're more going to work with are what we call histograms. Histograms are going to be our classic way of representing quantitative data, and it's going to look a lot like a bar graph. And I'll, I'll draw a histogram first. So, um, say without just other information say if I have from say this is 1 to 6 and then 11 and 16 and 21 maybe these are uh, different ages of people a histogram instead of a bar graph which just shows one bar for each count or each uh, variable you're representing for histograms you're going to have a bar that represents a range of data so you're going to have a bar that represents from 1 to 6, like so. And another bar that goes from 6 up to 11. And then another bar from 11 to 16, maybe it's a little bit shorter. Another bar from 16 to 21, maybe like this. This would be a histogram. 
it's really good for a lot of quantitative data, particularly quantitative data that is what we call continuous, which means it can have any number between one and six. It's not just the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. Maybe the number 2.5 is possible or 3.7 is possible. Um, so histograms are, and ranges of data are a lot better for that. The y-axis though is still going to be a frequency count though. So how frequent something is. So maybe this goes from one to two, three, four, something like that. So it still will represent a frequency count, which is why we can still work with frequency charts. However, what we're more gonna call those is grouped frequency. And that's because a grouped frequency chart instead is going to show something like if I looked at this graph, maybe if I say this was 10, 20, 30, and 40, that way this bar makes a little more sense. If I make a grouped frequency chart for this, then what that would look like is I have a group here, a frequency here, and my first group would be one to, one to six, or what I'd actually say is one to five. And the next one would start at six and go up to 10 and then 11 up to 15. Notice I'm keeping the same spacing all the time. 16 up to 21. And I put those frequencies here. So maybe the 16 to 21 looks a little bit low, maybe it's eight. 11 to 15, maybe it's 35. Six to 10, maybe it's around 39. And one to five looks at 20, something like that. So we could still have frequency charts and we can also make them relative frequency if we wanted to. Um, but the way that we represent that data is a little bit different. It's not just one bar for this and then a space and one bar for this and then a space. With histograms, you should have no spaces in between these bars. The only time you'll ever have a space in between the bar is if you have a group that's completely empty. Like maybe if 16 to 21 had zero frequency, but then, uh, or really you should say 16, 20, I guess. Um, then 21 up to 26, or 20, 21 up to 25 rather, had some values. Then this would be an empty bar and I have another bar going up. So that's the only time you'll ever have a space there. These histograms are really, really, really good for quantitative data and really the uh, one of the only ways we ever represent quantitative data. So, with that, what I want to do is show you an example of this. Before we get into, there's, a, there's another plot we can do, but I wanted to do this one first. Uh, so we have the total cost of textbooks for the term was collected from 36 students. Uh, create a histogram for this data. So we have that data right here, and what we're going to do is create a histogram for it. Thankfully, this data is already in numerical order, so it should be a lot easier to create. When we are creating a histogram, what we want to look at is both the beginning and the end. And we want to think of a way of splitting that up evenly. So we have somewhere between like five and 20 bars or five and 20 classes as we'll call them. Uh, however, we don't want to make it too thin. So we don't have a histogram that looks like one bar here, space, another bar here, space, another bar, and maybe another bar, and then the space. We don't want the histogram to look like this. This is horrible. So we don't want to make it too wide. So let's see how many there are. Keep in mind that there's 35 numbers in between there. So we have 140 to 460. If I subtract those, 460 minus 140. Let's write that here. So if I do 460 minus 140, I have that these numbers spread 320 numbers. There's 36 of them. Maybe let's split this into, let's see, 32, that splits up into eight pretty nicely. So let's do 30, uh, 320 divided by eight to get 40. I'm trying to think of a good number to use for my classes. And then with that, we can create a class. So I'll create the class over here. So class and then the frequency. It's always good to make this first, then create your histogram, so it's a lot easier to go back and forth. All right, so my first number starts at 140, so let's start my first class there. So 140 
And then my next class, I want to start 40 after that. That's why I divide that into 8, because I'm like, yeah, let's make 8 bars. Maybe you wanted to make 6 bars, that's fine. Um, so my next class is going to start 40 after that, so 180. And then 40 after that, so 220. And I continue on this fashion. 260, 300, 340, 380, and 420. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right, good. looks good. Then each of these classes are going to go right up to the next number. However, the way we, way we tend to write this is instead of writing 140 to 180 and then 180 to 220, uh, what we do is 140 up to 179, and then 180 up to 219 instead of 220. The reason we do one number prior is because it's a lot easier for people to read this. If I say 140 to 180, and then I have the number 180, which I do in the listing, the question then becomes, where do I put that? Do I put that in the first class or the second one? Well, the answer should be the second one, but this is a good way of designating that. Really, this says 140 up to, but not including 180. So 140 up to 179.999999, but a lot cleaner to read like this. So I'm going to continue on like this. All these are going to end in 9, so this one's going to go up to 299. Then this is 300 up to 339. And then we have uh, 340 up to 379. 380 up to 419. And then 420 up to, I'll just say 460, because that's where that's going to go. All right. Um, nah. Nah, we should really keep those separate. So it looks like there's going to be one more class, because I do have 460 as a number itself. So what I'm going to do is make another separate class that goes from 460 up to uh, 499. And then this one, 420 up to 459. All right, so there's actually going to be nine classes here. All right. Now all we need to do is make these frequencies. So 140 up to 180, but not including. I have 1, 2, 3, 4. So I can count those 1, 2, 3, 4. And put that frequency there. Then 180 up to 220, but not including. So 1. 220 up to 260, but not including. 220, 1, 2, 3, 4. For 260, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 300, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there's going to be a tall bar there. 340, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3D, 1, 2. 420 is 1. And then there's 2 at 460. We have all those counted, and if we want to be even more sure, we can count 4 plus 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 10 plus 6 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2. Add all those frequencies up. So if I do 4 plus 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 10 plus 6 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2, add all those up, what I get is a total of 36, which is what I should get. According to the description, there are, well, according to the description, there are 36 students. So I should have a total frequency of 36. Now to make my histogram, I'm going to give myself enough room here. To make my histogram, I'm going to start at 140 down here. And then my next bar is going to go up to the beginning of the next class, which is 180. Then 220. And then all these are going to increase by 40, because that's what I determined I wanted the width of my class to be. Now again, when you move that, I, I chose to make 8 or 9 classes arbitrarily. I just felt good. I don't want to make too many, and that felt like a good amount. Um, if you made and said five or six, it'd probably work just fine. Kind of a judgment call. So 380, uh, 420, and 460. So I'm going to move that over real quick. I'm just going to pause and do that. All right, so I moved them all over. And I had enough room to fit in all the rest of my values. I uh, notice I was also trying to keep the width roughly the same for all of them because I did try to keep uh, the class width to be the same of 40. 
I just did the best I could. Look at my frequencies, they, though. They go up to 10, so I don't need to go too high up with this. So maybe we just need to go up by twos. be a good way to represent it. So twos, four, six, eight, and 10, saying that these are my frequencies. And on the bottom, these are not really my classes. This is supposed to represent uh, cost of textbooks. So let's say money. And say a title is cost of textbooks. Now we have all our information and we can make our bars. So 140 to 179 goes up to four. So 140 goes up to four. It goes over to 180. And then one, that's gonna start off from my previous bar. And then another four. Notice how I'm building these. There's no spaces in between. It's supposed to just flow from one to the next. And hopefully we can start to see maybe a shape start to show up when I make this graph. The next one goes up to six and then 10. You can also create what we call grid lines on graphs, which is uh, these horizontal lines that come out from these numbers here. It makes it a lot easier to track from left to right to see how high a specific bar is, both for the reader and for yourself when you're creating it. This one also goes up to six, then two, one, and two. So two, one is half that, and then two. All right, so that'd be an example of a histogram. A lot more, a lot easier to read than both the presented information here, and arguably better than the uh, values over here on the frequency chart. Uh, however, that's debatable. Uh, a lot would like to look at this and you start to see stuff like, okay, well, there's a majority here between 300 and 340 and it starts to uh, become less and less the further you move away from that. But there is a spike over here between 140 and 180. We can start to describe things here and start to analyze the information just looking at the shape of this graph. That's why histograms are so nice. Uh, there is a danger though with histograms and that's simply because the second that we moved into class data, like we did over here, and then we go into a histogram, we've already lost information. For example, this last bar that I have from 460 to 500, it has a height of two, which means there's two numbers between 460 and 500. But if I look at the original information, those two numbers were 460 itself. So I don't actually have any numbers between 461 and 500, although it makes it seem that way. So presenting data with a class, that means you already lose some information. So there is a danger for it, which is why you don't want to make them too wide or too thin. All right, I hope that gives you a nice example of what a histogram is doing. Now, there's one other thing we can do with quantitative data. Um, and what you can make with quantitative data is what we call a scatter plot. Uh, now, I'm not going to go too deep into this because you don't do much with scatter plots in our class, or so we just want to address it real quick um, because scatter plots presents a different style of information. Instead of just looking at one set of data, like we were looking at for cost of textbooks, or maybe we're looking at the height of individuals and just looking at that information, what if we looked at one piece of information and then compare that to another related one? For example, here we have club head speed, so how fast you swing a golf club versus how far the ball that you hit travels in yards. So your speed that you hit, that you swing the golf club, and how far the ball will travel. Well, that's two different variables. We have the variable for club head speed, so how fast you hit it, and then how far it travels. And what we have here are each of those these two different values for each golf ball. How for golf ball one, how fast you hit it and how far it traveled. For golf ball two, how fast you hit it and how far it traveled. And same thing for all of these. Five, six, seven, eight. We have eight different values here. Well, to present this data, what we can do is create what we call a scatter plot, which is what we have down here. To create a scatter plot, what we're going to do is take each of our pieces of information and plot them as just a point. On the bottom, I have club head speed. So for example, the first number is 100. And on the Y value, I have distance traveled, so up to 257. So I'll say 100 
up to about 257 is roughly there. It's a little bit less than 260. I do the same thing for all these points. That way I'm representing each individual golf ball with an individual point. 102 goes to 264, so roughly there. 103 to 274. 101 to 266. 105 to 277. 100 to 263. So we have another 100, but this one traveled further. 99 and 258. And lastly, 105 and 275. So another 105. Um, this one didn't travel as far. Now, this would be a scatter plot. This is representing each different point and how they plot against e each other. In this case, we're not going to use this like a bar graph or histogram and see how tall they are, really. What we're trying to look at is a trend. We're trying to see if there is some what we call correlation between these variables. I see that as club head speed is increasing, so as I go more in this direction, then likewise the distance is getting further and further. The distance is also increasing. This is what we would call a positive correlation. If I instead had points that went the other way, as one increased, the other decreased, we call that a negative correlation. And that all boils down to trying to create a what we call line of best fit that tries to approximate this data. I see that a lot of these points are following along this trend, a little bit above, a little bit below, but they're all following generally this trend, which hopefully I could use to try to make a prediction. For example, if I were to swing a club uh, or a golf ball at 104 miles per hour, maybe I'd predict that they'd uh, hit the ball about 274 miles per hour, or about 274 yards, if they swung it at 104 miles per hour. That's maybe what I would predict. That's what we would do with scatter plots. Now, you're not going to do too much with those, which is why I don't really have an in-depth example here. But it's just good to recognize what's happening with the scatter plot. That you're trying to take two pieces of information, plot them against each other, and see if there's a connection going on there. See if there's like a trend or a shape that forms uh, when you put those two points against each other. But with that said, that's everything I want to talk about in this video. In the next video, we're going to be talking, we're going to continue through this uh, chapter. We're going to talk about actual values that you can calculate to summarize the data instead of just the uh, graphical ways of representing the data. Uh, but with that said, I hope this helped. You should be able to complete some of the homework assignments and quiz uh, problems at this point, and I recommend doing so before moving on. Uh, I hope you have a nice day.